Honor means to respect someone and make someone feel special. Like to do something nice. When someone tells you what to do, you should do it. I like, I do my laundry or I do something nice for them. Um, 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 um I make a card for them. Help them by cleaning the table. Um, 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 um. Pick up my clothes and put them in the right piles. Sometimes I do a, a whole batch of laundry for my mom because she stays up really late doing the laundry. Like when we really want to not stop doing stuff that we love to do, it's very hard for us to stop. Leave my clothes. Strewn about on the floor, on my bed. Um, 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 um. Like when it's hard of not to read a book, when I should read it a different time, it's super hard to do that because I just love reading and I just want to read that book so bad and I just have to read it and sometimes I find a way to do it. Like I'm not really nice to my sister, Carly, because she's annoying. We don't listen in our classrooms. Probably when I go under their bed with the dog, because it's all dirty down there, but my dog always goes under the bed. Because, because, um, because, um, because, um, because, um, because, 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 because. Um, um, um. <laughs> hey, with Father's Day, just barely in our rear view mirror, I've, I've got a question for this morning. How do you go about searching for the perfect Mother's Day card or Father's Day card? What does that look like in your world? Uh, do you go about it with great gusto, like you're going on this grand adventure? Do you, do you go with particular ponder in pursuit of the perfect card? I, do you go in with a heavy heart, knowing that there is no card that's going to convey your true sentiment? Or do you go in with absolute abandon, you swoop in, grab the first card your hand touches, and you never read the inside of it until you're ready to sign it, only find out that the words congratulations <laughs> had nothing to do with Father's Day. So you grab a Sharpie and you scribble inside, I got you a card. Or in horror, on the day of, the first time you hear somebody that says, Happy Father's Day, you pull out your cell phone, you pull up the Hallmark app and send an e-card. Or maybe you're like me, my wife is so organized that she's got all those cards purchased well in advance and she just hands them to me, sign here, and I dutifully do that. Okay, so today we are exploring commandment number five, honor your father and your mother. Now, this is part two in a series on the Ten Commandments. And Pastor Kevin walked us through the first four C's over the last four weeks, which provided our framework for these next six. Now, I think that if we've got no deep esteem for God, we will find it difficult developing deep esteem for others. And these next six weeks, we're going to deal with our horizontal relationships with humans in contrast to our vertical values that we established in the first four commands. We might say the first four commandments are a way for us to honor our creator. The next six commandments talk about how we honor our creator as we honor his creation. The beauty in all these commands is that they provide guardrails for us for navigating the roads of life. The problem is that I think that many of us, we view commands as barriers to a blissful life. And so we need to understand that our guardrails are there to protect us from peril, but we don't often follow them and we choose to ignore them. And ignore them, we do. We deserve to be on the other side of the barrier. We deserve to swim with alligators, to walk on the sides of the cliff beyond the safe point. And this one's just for you, dog lovers. 
And uh, if the sign said, play here, there would be no one on that barrier. We just don't like being told what to do. But guard, God's guardrails are in place for our good benefit. If you've got your outline there in front of you, you might want to fill in there. This first one here is his commands set limits for our provision and our protection. His commands set limits for our provision and our protection. And my assignment, as I told you, is the exploration of guardrail number five. And it stands out from the final five commandments and that this is a do this instruction as opposed to a don't do that command. It first appears in the books of, book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 12, where it says, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. It's the only horizontal commandment that comes with commentary. So that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. I wonder if God felt like he had to sweeten the deal for us. Nonetheless, there is provision when we are in pursuit of a positive relationship with parents. It shows up the next time in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 5, and this is the 40th anniversary event of this. And Moses repeats God's commands, and number five comes with two amendments. The first one is that in Deuteronomy 5, 16, the reminder here is that this is a command of the Lord, letting us know that this is not some social construct of man. You can go ahead and put that verse up there. Thank you. And the second thing is, is that things would go well with them in the land they're about to possess. I think part of what he was saying is that fractured families are going to make for a frustrated future. So pay attention to the limits that I put for your provision and protection. Now, the second reading in this, the second presentation of this falls on ears of a whole new generation, reminds me that each generation is going to hear these commands through a little bit different filter. The Exodus crowd, they are coming fresh out of the confines of Egypt, and they would have experienced one of two things. Either they are leaving behind the memory of their parents who did not make it out, and remembering what they put into things under slavery, or they are the children of parents who are escaping Egypt who have lived under the oppression, the suffering, and the sweat of their Egyptian taskmasters. Either way, God was calling them to either honor the memory or the misery of parents who literally labored on their behalf back in that land. And as they moved forward, they were to remember that they should be honoring the provision of their parents. Fast forward to the 40th anniversary crowd. And they are on the cusp of coming into the promised land in Canaan. And they would have received this command through the lens of a lifetime of listening to parents moan and grumble and complain about leadership, both Moses and the Lord's, and the lack of God's provision, even after they had shunned God's gift of a promised land. Now you can read about that in the book of Numbers, chapters 13, 14, and 15. We're not going there this morning. But I tell you, it is not exactly honor material. But God is telling them that they need to honor those parents anyway. The biblical record continues in New Testament times, reminding us that the commandments were still in force then. The Gospels of Matthew and Mark both attest to Jesus quoting commandment number five as he called out those who had minimized this commandment, the religious leaders had provided a loophole where you could take your money or your material goods and you could make them as devoted to God and as such they would no longer be available for use in the care of aging or needy parents. And Jesus did not approve. 
uh, decades later, the Apostle Paul writes a letter to the church in Ephesus, where the majority of those Christians there are, are Gentile Christians, and they have no strong cultural ties to the Ten Commandments. And he exhorts them in the following. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. And he echoed the sentiment in his letter to the Colossian church. He said, children, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. This commandment remained active all through New Testament times. And it remains in effect for us today. So why should we consider this? Well, God commanded it. Jesus expected it. And Paul exhorted it. So what is honor? How do we define it? Well, for those of you that are interested in such things, the Hebrew word in the text, Exodus and Deuteronomy, is the word kabad. And it means, it means heavy or weighty. To honor was to give something weight as in importance. The Apostle Paul, as he's writing, he's using, uh, he's writing in Greek, uses the Greek word tamao, which means value. And this begins to give us a picture. Honor is giving weight or importance or value, in this case, to fathers and mothers. Centuries later, the Protestant theologian John Calvin ascri ascribed these three qualities to honor. Obedience reverence, and gratitude. Now, obedience is the act or the practice of obeying, dutiful or submissive compliance. Reverence is a feeling or an attitude of deep respect tinged with awe. And gratitude is the quality or feeling of being grateful or thankful. Let me ask you a question. Would that be a reflection of how you see your parents? Parents, is that how you think your kids see you? Here's how my brain works. That Hebrew word kabat, Sounds like kebab, like shish kebab. <laughs> and I just see that shish kebab is made up of obedience, reverence, and gratitude. I'm just going to sit there while we continue to explore this meaty topic. I wanted to find out how some others saw this, and so I did a little poll of about two dozen people of various ages and stages, and I asked four questions of them. I asked them, what comes to mind when you hear the phrase, honor your father and your mother? What gets in the way of doing so? What makes it easy? And then how do or did your parents model honor for you? Here's how they answered the first question. What comes to mind when you think of the phrase, honor your father and mother. Be respectful. Obey them. It's biblical. Someone said, kindness. One person asked the question, how? how? What does that look like? And another person answered simply, number five, fifth commandment. I think that's pretty close to our kebab. Obedience, reverence, gratitude. So why do we honor parents? God commanded it. Jesus expected it. And Paul exhorted it. 
Now, Paul also reminded us a little bit more in that Ephesians passage. He says, honor your father and mother, which is the first command with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. Now, does that mean that honoring our parents will have a perfect, if we honor our parents, we'll have a perfect pain-free existence into our golden years? Probably not. But I want to explore for a minute here what might be the harm of not honoring our parents. What if we ignore God's guardrails in commandment number five? What if, what if instead of gratitude for them having given us life, we just grumble at their every little nuance that bugs us? What if instead of reverence for them, our words are more apt to revile them? And what if instead of obeying their instructions, we object to their teaching? The relationship is left to starve. Because honor is nutrition for the soul. We withhold it, and we grow up with resentment and bitterness and regret. And that can pull us down emotionally, and it can tear away at us physiologically. Life will be anything but going well for us, and if we do live long, it will be anything but enjoyable. The writer of Proverbs touched on this. Chapter three starts out this way. My son, do not forget my teachings, but keep my commands in your heart. They will prolong your life many years and they will bring you peace and prosperity. Ignore my teaching, disregard the commands and you'll find yourself in places you don't belong with consequences you won't believe. I think the whole first section of Proverbs through chapter nine, it's ripe with instruction on right living and the warning of consequences of walking in our own ways. And when I read them with the commandments in mind, it seems like Solomon had the commandments in his mind as he was dispensing wisdom to his kids. But all of these fit somewhere in the last five commands. Proverbs 3.29 do not plot harm against your neighbor. 3.30, do not accuse a man for no reason. 5.22, the evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare him. 6.3, if you've been entrapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth, do this to free yourself. Go and humble yourself at your neighbor's hand. Let's get back to the survey. What did people say got in the way of honoring mom and dad. The first three were barriers that they put up. The first one, somebody said, my, my ego. Someone mentioned my selfishness. And this next one, uh, I think it was probably a teenager, said, testing my boundaries. This next one, I think, can fall on either person, parent or child. When there's disagreement, when there's differences of opinion, and there's no workaround, there's no way to come back together, the child found it difficult to show honor to parent. The next two, though, fall squarely on our shoulder, parents. Parents who were not walking a life of faith, and children were looking on that and finding it hard to show honor. And then parents who were dabbling or neck deep in substance abuse or living out inappropriate lifestyles that put up barriers to be able to honor mom and dad. What made it easy? What allowed for this to take place? When I bring things to mom or dad and they hear me, when they'll listen to my concerns, when their suggestions or directions back to me come from the heart, when they bring things to me honestly, but with warmth, and when they parent 
with consistency. When they are appropriate real role models. And then one person responded, we're commanded, they are God's chosen parent for us. Now, for the last four weeks, Pastor Kevin has been referring to these two books here, The Ten Commandments by Kevin DeYoung and Ten by Mark Mitchell. And in Mark's book, by the way, both of these books are available out in the bookstore after the service. You're welcome to go by and grab a copy. But in Mark Mitchell's book, he, he talks about, about the fact that honoring is different at every phase. Um, as a child, it's really weighted toward obedience. And that was at the core of Paul's message for us. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. As a teenager, reverence starts to dip for some reason. But that does not give us as teens license to not respect our parents. As young adults, when magically overnight, our parents gain all of their wisdom back. <laughs> we can live out with a sense of gratitude of how they've poured into us in earlier stages, and we can thank them for not disinheriting us when we were teens. As we move into midlife and we have opportunity to honor parents, as they navigate into their golden years, it may be visits or errands or financial aid or T-I-M-E, time. Uh, it's not a pat on the back. This is just simply a fact. Fridays at noon, you'll find my mom and I at Happy Girl Kitchen in Pacific Grove. It's our weekly standing go-to that keeps us connected at least that one time a week. And we're together quite more often than that, but that's our standing Friday date. I ran across an article in World Magazine. Uh, it's an article which related, I think, what is an inspiring example of offering continued respect. Let me read it to you. When Patrick Mead took his father to a dementia care facility, he wanted people to know about the important new resident in room 14. So he taped this note on his dad's door. My name is Bill Mead. I was born in abject poverty. I became a warrior, U.S. Navy, Korean War era. I then laid aside my weapons and I became a minister and a missionary spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am slowly leaving this earth for my heavenly home. This may take a while. Thank you for remembering who I was and who I am. I'm a man, a warrior, a missionary, a father, a friend, and so much more. I have one more river to cross. Patrick Mead was determined that his father would be respected even when he didn't appear to merit it to those who knew nothing about his past. That's love. That's honoring your father until the heavenly father calls him home. One last stage. When you're old and they're gone, we can still honor their memory both in word and deed. My father passed away a year ago and my youngest brother Mark suggested that we hold the memorial at Pacific Grove Municipal Ballpark. My dad spent decades there as a player, as a coach, as an umpire. And we all agreed that was the perfect place to honor him. And I will tell you that a year later, people still bump into us and they say, wow, what a great send off for your dad. What a great way to honor who he was. I'm going to tell you, we never stop being the children of our parents. And so honor becomes a lifetime discipline. And if we're parents, we can recognize that those seasons change for our children as well. And we need to be ready to accept those changes 
as they find new ways to show honor to us. Knowing that our kids' honor criteria changes, I think, is a good reminder for us that parents, we don't have license to live as we like. We don't have license to live as we like. Then maybe a good lens to look at this through is from the phase project. If you've been around here at all for any length of time, you've probably heard me talk about marbles and the jar of marbles that represent the life of our kids. 936 marbles, 936 weeks from birth to the time we launch them off to whatever is next. One marble for every week, and week after week, we're pulling marbles out of the jar that represent something that's taken place in the life of our kids. And at the end of that time period, they're launched on to new adventures, and we've lost all of our marbles. <laughs> Along the way, you've either developed or disintegrated your parental influence. The phase project, I think, describes it like this, graphic on the screen. We start with strong positional influence, that top left circle there. We're the ultimate authority in the eyes of our child. They don't know anything else. We are it. They look to us for everything. And over time, their world expands and they rely on us less and less and less as they develop capacities and additional relationships that speak into their world. On the other hand, our relational influence starts down here at zero. And it's developed throughout their childhood. And the goal is for that positional influence and that relational influence to swap spaces so that when your positional authority is exhausted and has ceased, your relational influence still has bearing on their lives. If we live in ways that promote honor in the home, relational influence can thrive, and honor is not hindered. If you're interested in learning more about that, when we get to the fall, Wednesday nights at Shoreline, when Awana starts back up and all that, we're gonna be going through parenting through the phases uh, and it's just one of the offerings that we'll have in that night. We'll tell you more about that in August. I also want to let you know that your church staff, all of us, are reading through the entire New Testament this year. And each month is a staff meeting that's devoted to a book, that, that a book or a series of books that we're reading, uh, 27 New Testament books, 12 months, so obviously they don't all fit in. But this month, uh, we are going through the book of Romans. We met just this last week, last Wednesday, and Pastor Keith took us through the book of Romans. And as I was driving to work that morning, I was thinking of Romans chapter 12. It's one of my favorite chapters in that book, and I just love the second half of that. And as the Lord would have it, that's the chapter that Pastor Keith so beautifully took us through. And I want to look at it this morning just thinking about that as it relates to honor and parenting. So if you'd like to, and you want to turn to Romans chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 9, and we're just going to look at a few of these verses here, but I want to share them with you. It starts out in verse 9, it says, love must be sincere. Now you say, wait a minute, Roy, I thought you were talking about honor. No, no, no. Love is the foundation stone for any character that God builds into us. And so if you want to substitute honor, that's okay, but love must be sincere, even with parents. Uh, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another, including parents, in brotherly love. Honor one another, including parents, above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord. What was the basis of the Apostle Paul's comment? What did he say? Obey your parents as into the, unto the Lord. That's what serves him. It says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction. If there's strife or things are not right between 
parent and child, that we be patient in that, faithful in prayer for the relationship and for them. Uh, then skip down to verse 17. It says, do not repay anyone evil for evil, fully recognizing that there are situations that there are parents who are not exactly honorable, but we have a responsibility. And it comes in verse 18. It says, if it is possible, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone, including your parents. We don't have license to live as we like. Proverbs 3, 27 says, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to act. Now, if you get hung up on that little part there, those who deserve it, God says parents are deserving of honor. Obedience, reverence, and gratitude regardless. We don't have license to live as we like. By and large, honoring parents brings blessing. God is honored. Parents are honored. And we keep the doors open for honor in our homes. Those who don't develop honor for parents may end up demanding honor from their children. They don't know any other way. And it's a perpetual cycle as the children have no way of teaching honor to their children. Those who don't develop honor for parents will find it difficult to develop honor for anyone else who is in a position of authority. And it's one more reason I think that God intends for our homes to be the center of personal and spiritual development. Final little section here. Parents, we increase the potential for spiritual and honor legacy when we model honor for our kids. Let me repeat that. We increase the potential for spiritual legacy when we model honor for our children. Back to the survey. How do or did your parents model honor for you? Following responses. Caring for elderly parents. Uh, quality time. Even though we lived at a distance, making sure that we had the ability to visit. Uh, spoke well of them, regardless. Honoring family traditions. One person responded, keeping grandma connected to us. And high respect for their parents, even in differences. The number one recurring response was how parents modeled care for their aging or elderly parents, especially in spite of poor relationship. And this is a reminder that we don't all have parents who have presented themselves as honorable. Pastor Dennis and I were talking about this. He reminded me that one in four parents, statistically one in four parents, is abusive in some fashion. And this may be a real challenge for you this morning trying to figure out how you might honor your mom or dad. But we're still called to do so. So what can we do? And I'd like for us to just pause for a moment and think about this. And then we'd ask the Lord to make obvious some way that you can be obedient to their needs or their desires. That you would... I don't know if that'll stand, that you would ask him to reveal some attribute of theirs that you could reverence or at least show some level of respect. And that you would ask him to, to grant you grateful heart on their behalf, even if you can only start with the fact that they brought you into being. Did the Holy Spirit prompt anything in you? Write it down. And then do something about it. 
I will tell you that likewise, we have a responsibility to live honorably for the sake of our children and our grandchildren. The Brothers Grimm wrote about this in a little generational short tale. There was once a very old man whose eyes had become dim and his ears dull of hearing and his knees trembled and when he sat at the table he could hardly hold his spoon and he'd spill broth on the tablecloth or let it run down his mouth. His son and his son's wife were disgusted with this and eventually the father was left over in the corner behind the stove and they gave him his food in a little earthenware bowl and not even enough of that. And he used to look toward the table with tears in his eyes. And once, his trembling hands couldn't hold the bowl and he dropped it and it fell to the ground and broke. And the young wife scolded him. And he said nothing, just sighed. They bought him a little wooden bowl for a few half pence out of which he had to eat from that time forward. And they were once sitting in this arrangement when the little grandson, four years old, was arranging some little wood pieces on the floor. And dad asked him, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm making a trough for mom and dad to eat from when I'm big. The man and his wife looked at each other and presently they began to cry. And they took the grandfather back to the table and henceforth always let him eat with them and likewise said nothing if he ever spilled anything at all. We don't have license to live how we like because they're watching. Lest you think God is not interested in legacy, I want you to consider the words of Moses shortly after delivering the commandment on that 40th anniversary. It's around 1450 BC and Moses declares this, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them as you sit at home, as you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Some 400 years later, Psalm 78 outlines something similar. Listen to these words. My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old. Things we've heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. Get this, he decreed statutes for Jacob and he established the law, 10 of them, for Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children and they would put their trust in God and they would not forget his deeds, but they would keep his commands. They would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God and whose spirits were not faithful to him. God invites us to follow after him and to live within the limits of his provision and his protection. And his design and his desire is that we would honor our father and our mother. God commanded it. Jesus expected it. Paul exhorted it. We need to live it. Let's pray. Lord, would you reveal to us the ways that we can take obedience and reverence and gratitude and offer it up to you as a gift to parents. 
And then, Lord, would you allow us to live our lives in a way that does not hinder the same from our own children and grandchildren so that again in that, you would be honored. Amen.